Um, all right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens. This is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, and tonight, tonight we will actually begin with a question. And it's a question that Renata asked at the end of uh, last Sunday. And since it was right at the end and it was such a great, important question, I decided to just wait in giving an answer and we would pick it up today. So let me give you a little background uh, from last week in case you weren't here to kind of contextualize Renata's question. So we've been reading this sutra, the Upaya Sutra, and we've reached a point, this is a pretty long sutra, and we've reached a point in the kind of part two, I think it is, where we are being told uh, the life story of the Buddha, pretty classic elements of the life story of the Buddha. And I'm speaking specifically not kind of about the historical knowledge that we know of the Buddha, but the mythology. And I'm specifically talking about sort of the what has become known as the story of Siddhartha, like that kind of classic story of Siddhartha. But we are hearing this story being told in a new way. And what I mean by that is that this sutra is kind of doing a kind of interesting thing where, and this is what the topic of last week's Dharma Doors was, this sutra is basically kind of putting a Buddha, the Buddha, but we are to understand this is for all Buddhas in a way. <clears throat> this sutra is putting a Buddha outside of the human realm. And last week I did a talk about an early school of kind of very early Buddhism called Lokottara Vadanism, the Lokottara Vadans. And they were sort of one of the first Buddhist groups, seemingly, to do this, to suggest <clears throat> maybe the Buddha, maybe a Buddha, isn't human, is transcendent, lokotara, out of this world. And of course, there are, uh, there are some other Buddhist traditions, early Buddhist traditions, the Theravada tradition, for example, and they kind of stick to the more historical idea of the Buddha was, you know, just a person, just a human, born of human parents, <clears throat> and basically got enlightened. And so because Buddha was human, you're human, you can get enlightened too. So we did a little bit of talking last Sunday about that difference. The difference between the Buddha as just a historical figure versus Buddha as a transcendent ideal in that sense. So, of course, what I mentioned last week is that the Loka Taravadins, like that way of thinking of the Buddha, that becomes the Mahayana Buddhist way of thinking about the Buddha. That is exactly how the Mahayana think of the Buddha, not as a human, not as a historical person from India from 500 BC. No, Buddha is, Buddha is awake, awakeness is awakening in that way. So in the context of that, what we came across was a, a kind of revamping, a revamping of the story of the Buddha. And so what we came across was this section, which said, so it was about how the Bodhisattva, and here they're talking about the Buddha before he was the Buddha. So in a lifetime, lifetimes before there was a seeker, the Bodhisattva, who became reborn as Siddhartha. But here in this sutra last week, we learned that the Bodhisattva actually did not 
enter his mother's womb. And why? Because the bodhisattva had already entered an undefiled meditative state in the Toshita heaven and remained in that meditative state and just appeared to enter the womb of Queen Maya and just appeared to be born, but wasn't actually born in that way. He, and I'm, I'm reading directly from this now, he appeared to enter the womb of his mother. He appeared to enjoy the five sensual pleasures. He appeared to leave the household life and he appeared to practice austerities. All, and it says, all sentient beings took these things to be real, but to the bodhisattva, these were just a magical display. So that's what we were reading last week. But what happened was, is that in the context of this, we heard um, basically about the bodhisattva entering the womb, enjoying the sensual pleasures, leaving the household life and practicing, practicing austerities. The idea was, is that even though the bodhisattva appeared to do those things, the bodhisattva was actually pure in conduct. So this brings us to what Renata's question last week was. We started to get into this language of purity and defilement. And then Renata's question is, or, and Renata, please correctly correct me if I'm getting your question wrong. But the question, as I remember it, was why is the woman's womb, the mother's womb, considered defiled? And therefore, why are they saying that the Buddha was pure and that didn't actually happen? So, Renata, if that was, if I'm getting the gist of your question correct, this is, it is a, it's a great question. Now, I want to start my answer. This is going to be probably a long answer because it's such a good question. So I want to start with something really important. So actually, which should I start with? I have two, two points that I want to start with. Uh, I'll, let me start with this one. So I, as many of you know, right? Exactly. Basically, why is the womb considered defiled? That's, the, that's Renata's question. That's what we're going to answer. So as many of you know, I used to teach religion, like comparative religion in university back in New York, long time ago. And when, and all of my, my undergraduate degree, my graduate degree, all of that is in religious studies. And so I used to, when I would teach religion, I had a kind of a thing that I would say, and I probably have never had a reason to even mention it in Dharma doors or in a Buddhism class, but it was something that I sort of, through my undergraduate, graduate study of religion, I came to this kind of, not a realization, but I don't know, just something I thought of. And what it was, was, it was about how the underlying premise of all religions is that there's something wrong <laughs> with us. If it's Buddhism, we're ignorant, we're too desirous, we're too angry, all of those things. You know, Christianity, we have fallen, right? All of these things. So the idea is, is that the premise, the, the, the starting point of all religions is that the human being is flawed. So religions are there to help mankind, humankind, get unflawed. And it doesn't matter, again, what religion we're talking about. They all are kind of in the business of the presumption is that you're flawed but we have the answer for how to unflaw you in that way. 
that that yeah that seems to be you know that adds up but what i realized in my study of religion is that then we shouldn't really be surprised when flawed human beings get a hold of religion and mess it up and basically take their flaws and put it into the religion. So this has happened a lot in the course of religion, where even though they start off trying to help us, when we get a hold of them, we can kind of turn them into just reflections of our own flawed society or flawed culture. So... I want to talk about a little bit about how that kind of happens in, in Buddhism. So that was my first point, is that Buddhism is not the only religion to develop flaws as it has moved along, okay? And one of those flaws, in my opinion, and it's not just my opinion, it has to do with the early form of Buddhism, what today you would call the Theravada tradition, but that early Buddhist tradition that is, survives in the Theravada, it has a reputation for being very patriarchal, almost misogynistic in that sense, where women are considered lesser than the male practitioners. So there's an in inequity. And it always has always struck me as odd <laughs> that a tradition that is so bent on equanimity, non-duality, and all of these ideas should say, yeah, we're into equality, equanimity, and all of non-duality. But it, when it comes to men and women, it's, it's just, <laughs> it's not equal. That always struck me as odd. And as I have studied the history of Buddhism, not just the teachings, but the kind of cultural transitions, you notice these different cultures, whether it's down in Southeast Asia or East Asia or wherever, but these cultures, they get a hold of Buddhism and then kind of imprint their cultural tendencies. And so a lot of these very patriarchal cultures have not surprisingly developed rather patriarchal forms of Buddhism. So that's kind of what I'm talking about tonight is that sort of a kind of how did we get there? How did such how did a tradition that began on such a foundation of equanimity and equality, how did it move back almost into an inequitous kind of patriarchal mode? So I want to share with you one, one way that that happens. There's a lot of ways that that happens, and I couldn't exhaust them all in, in a Dharma door session. So I'm just going to focus on one. And it's actually, you can even see it happening in our sutra. So, and I'm going to use this as an example, but there are much more egregious examples of this in Buddhism and, and in other religions. But I want us to notice that the section that I just read, which was kind of one of the last ones I read last week, this section was about how the Buddha appeared to enter the womb of his mother. That's number one. He appeared to enjoy the five sensual pleasures. Now, I think we are to understand that as code for he got married, had sex, and had a child. It could be even just about enjoying the palace, enjoying all the food, enjoying all the music. It's probably about all of that too, but I do think that we're supposed to understand a kind of certain sexual thing going on there. So he appeared to enter the womb. He appeared to enjoy sensual pleasures. He appeared to renounce and leave the household life. And he appeared to practice austerities like fasting, not sleeping, all of these kind of classic 
um, austerities of Indian yoga and meditation. And then it starts talking about this idea of, oh yeah, and the bodhisattva was pure in conduct and this and that. And then at the end or in the middle of this, it just says, he did not enter the womb and so on because he had renounced worldly actions a long time ago. And what happens there is that the, the womb, the idea of entering the mother's womb, that was only one aspect of this. It had to do with sexuality. It had to do with renouncing the household life and austerities. And by the end of that paragraph, we've, we have forgotten all about leaving household life, practicing austerities, and we are only focused on the womb. And I want you to notice that there's an editorial thing going on there where, and, and it's not uncommon for sutras to Buddha, for Buddhist sutras to do this, where you have a really long list of things. And rather than constantly repeating that long list of things, they take just the first thing and use that later on. And they're assuming that you're gonna fill in the blanks, that you're gonna fill in all those other things. But what happens is, is that through editorial processes like that, we can forget those other things and just become hyper-focused on the one thing. And that's kind of what happens here. And it even kind of then leads to Renata's question of, wait, why is the womb defiled? Well, they were actually talking about the defilement of a lot of things. It's just that the womb became in, you know, uh, indicative or became representative of all those other aspects of worldly existence. So that kind of leads me, or that's my entry into kind of my answer to Renata's question of what's up with the defilement of the womb? Well, we're talking about worldly things. We're talking about being in the world of worldly things. And the idea is, is that it's not so much that the womb is defiled, but it's that the womb is considered kind of our entry point into the world in that way. So just like in the sutra, this journey begins via the womb, but it continues through all of the rest of life. So Renata, I'm going to have a lot more to say about this, but right away, what I would like to point out is that the defilement of the womb is not really about the womb so much as that it's the way that beings come into the world. And for Buddhism, the world is defiled, <laughs> all of this. So the doorway that you get into the world by is considered sort of defiled, but only in, in that sense that it's the gateway to the defiled world. But once again, it would be very easy to forget that and to just start to get hung up on the womb. And then as soon as we're hung up on the womb, it would be very easy to then just extrapolate that to the whole woman. Now you're entering the idea of women being defiled. Now, I'm not saying that that's Buddhism's position, not at all. But I am saying that in some Buddhist traditions that are a little more archaic, a little more, much more conservative, they do exhibit a slight, um, and I don't know quite what you would call it, but this sort, sort of derogatory derision towards women in that way as being slightly more defiled than men. So that, again, I want to separate a kind of cultural reality to Buddhism from the essential teachings or the Dharma in that way. If, if, 
if you study religion, if you ever study religion, if you go to a religion department, one of like one of the classes that I took in my undergraduate, it was about this idea of precept and practice. And those ideas are the, the whole course, this whole course I took was about how every religion says one thing, but does another thing. That there is a difference between the precept of what like should be the case and then what is actually going on in that way. For example, in the Catholic church, for example, Priests are supposed to be celibate. Priests are supposed to not be involved in sexuality at all with anybody. That's the precept. Apparently, the practice is a little different. I won't say anything more about it, but there's a lot of stories about, of course, Catholic priests and their sexual tendencies. So difference between precept and practice. Buddhism has the same situation where there's going to be Buddhism on paper, meaning like what we should be doing, the ideology that we should be espousing, and then what we're actually practicing in that way. So what I have tried to share with you briefly is how it can happen that a sutra with a teaching could get edited, edited again, and then focused in on, and then extrapolated. <laughs> so does that make sense? That kind of progression of how that might possibly happen? Okay, but that, again, that's not really my answer to Renata's question. So one of the things, this is a tricky question, Renata, because there's a way in which for many, like, especially a lot of the people who've come to Dharma Doors a lot, there's sort of like a kind of very simple, obvious, uh, hold on, I'm going to read Renata's uh, comment real quick. Yep, exactly. So the idea is, and sorry, I just lost my train of thought, just want to keep up with where everybody's at. So what I for regular Dharma doors people who've been coming a lot, the answer is kind of really obvious to this. But because I know not everybody comes all the time, and that there's even maybe probably new people or people watching, I want to explain this idea kind of two different ways. And the I want to do this for a few reasons, but I want to talk about like one way of understanding what they're talking about. And it, it basically, I kind of gonna do a classic early Buddhism, later B Buddhism version of this. So we're gonna talk a little bit about early Buddhism and its kind of attitude about birth and death and all of that, and then transition to the Mahayana, the kind of, later teachings in that way. So this whole thing about the womb, being born, and all of that, it has everything to do with kind of what Buddhism is talking about. And what I mean is, is that, and this is sort of the answer I started to give last week, but as you know, Buddhism, the tradition, all of them, it's very focused on this idea we have that we call ourselves, the self. Buddhism is very interested in that idea of me, I, mine. So me, I, and mine, right? So as all of you know, if you've been coming to Dharma doors or you've studied Buddhism, Buddhism is based upon this teaching of no self, anatman. 
Well, and what does that mean, no self? Well, I talk about it a lot. I've done entire Dharma door sessions just on the teaching of no self. And there's a lot of different ways to approach this idea. The way that I want to approach it in terms of talking about the early form of Buddhism is that it has a lot to do with basically what you could call identification. And it's the idea about identifying as or identifying with. And the idea is, is that a self is an identity, meaning you could identify with your name. Many of us do. Hi, I'm Michael. You could also identify with your occupation. Hi, I'm Michael, the teacher. You could identify with your nationality. Hi, I'm Michael, the American teacher. You could identify with your, not your first name, but your last name. You could identify with your family, your kind of your clan or your kin. So now I'm Michael, son of Howard, American teacher, right? So I could identify with all of those things. Oh, I could identify with my marital status. I'm a married person. I'm a spouse. And so, again, you start putting all of those identifications together. And that's what Buddhism understands as a self, a constructed identity, which is identifying with and as all the things that you identify with or as. <laughs> Now, there's one other major thing that we could and usually do identify with or as, and it's identifying with or as the physical body. If you were to ask, who, like, who are you? I could say this doesn't even need a name, doesn't need an occupation, doesn't need a marital status. I could just say, I am this. So most of us are doing all of that. We are identifying with body, name, occupation, all of it, and much, 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 much more than that. But a lot of the things that we identify with or as are built upon the more basic things that we are identifying with or as. And then those are probably based upon some basic ideas of identifying with this. So Buddhism has always been interested in that constructed sense of a self. And the realization is in early Buddhism, the realization is, is that I am not inherently married or single. What I mean by that is, is that I am currently married, but I could get a divorce and then I would no longer be married. Would I still be me? Well, the delusion of the self is that I'm me. I'm me. I used to be married. I'm not anymore. Or I used to not be married, and now I am. Okay. So now we can rule out <laughs> marital status as having anything to do with you because you just told me, or I just told you in that way, that I used to not be married, but now I am married. Ah, so it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're married or not, because I am both either of those. Great. So we've ruled that out. If you identify with your occupation, you might get a new job. And you could say, well, I used to be an architect, 
but now I'm a teacher. Oh, so you're not inherently an architect or a teacher because you just told me that you were once one and then the other. So you're good in that way. Oh, and okay, so you are not your occupation. Excellent. And now I could go down the line and I could change my name. I could change my physical appearance. I could keep changing all of these different things. And all the while, I would be saying, I used to be called Michael, but now I'm called Thomas or whatever. So now we're noticing that the I, the me, it's kind of floating underneath these identifications, but is not married or single or Michael or Thomas or this or that or any of those things because the me is claiming that it used to be this, used to be that, used to be this, used to be that. So there's just that self under there. What's that? <laughs> What's that? Meaning the self underlying all of this. What is that? It's not your name. It's not this. It's not that. So what exactly is it? And if you said that like you didn't even say anything, right? You just pointed and you said, no. or if you did speak, you would, you could say, no, well, I'm this. Okay. Let's examine that a little further, right? Now, many of you heard me walk you through this before, but the idea is, is that I might say that this is me. And the idea is, is that I could, in an unfortunate accident, I could lose a hand. Would I still be me? And once again, I would do the thing where I said, well, I, I used to have a hand, or I used to have two hands. Now I only have one hand. Oh, so you're still you, but now without a hand. Gotcha. Okay. I assume that goes for your other hand as well, that you are not either of your hands. In fact, what you're saying to me linguistically is that you have hands. That doesn't sound like you are hands. That sounds like you have them. And I assume that means that you have arms and you have legs and you have a torso and a heart and a brain and a this and a that. So you're not any of those things. You have them, but you're not them, because if you lost them, you would still say, I'm me? Now I'm very confused. What are you again? Or now that we've actually eliminated the hands and the arms and all of that, I have a better question for you. Where are you? This is where some of you might start somehow pointing to between the ears and behind the eyes, potentially, if I asked where you are, because you can't tell me that you're in your room or you're in San Francisco or you're because that's your physical body that's in those places. You've just told me or I just logically deduced that you are not the physical body. So, where are you? Now, we could keep searching. And as I often say, the Western scientific tradition is still searching. They're still looking. They are still uh, examining synaptic firings and neurons, trying to locate the self somewhere. Whereas 2,500 years ago, the Buddha or somebody realized, oh, there's not a self. It's all just the constructed identifications. That's the self, the constructed identifications. So let me share this with you. I was saying before that you could identify with your occupation 
And then if you got a new job or a new occupation, you would say, well, I used to be an architect, but now I'm a teacher. So identifying, identification is happening. You've just shifted that I'm this, now I'm that, right? So part of, not the entirety of it, but a piece of the Buddhist tradition is a very, very interesting path of non-identification. Not identifying with a job at all. Not identifying with a name at all. Not identifying with the body at all. And eventually not identifying. For some of us, for many of us, that might be a little hard to grok. Like, well, what, the, what would that be to be not identifying? Well, from a Buddhist point of view, what you want to start to notice, you want to start to notice that identifying, like with the job or this job, it's a subtle form of mental clinging, mental grasping. I'm, I'm this. And a insight, a realization that like about this idea, it has to do with dukkha. It has to do with suffering. And what I mean is, is that if one notice, and I, if th this might, may have happened to you, but if, if not, I'm sure you can imagine Imagine somebody who identifies with their occupation to, to a great degree, right? And then they get fired or they lose their job. There's a degree of existential anxiety that arises from that because I'm an architect, but I'm not an architect because I lost my job. So there's a clinging to that identity. And we can know that it's clinging if there's suffering when we lose it. And that goes for all of these identifications. You can notice that they are a form of clinging because when you lose the identification, there is potentially anxiety or stress, the dukkha that arises from the loss of that. Whereas, if you can imagine being actually really, really comfortable not identifying, really comfortable not clinging to these identities and actually just being, I use that term loosely, but just in a way being, that would speak to this kind of equanimity or this upeksha that the Buddhists are always talking about, that state of not grasping even at subtle things like identity in that way. Now, I want to make something really clear, as I always like to say. It would be one thing. It would be one type of religion if, if there was a true self or even if there was an existent ego. If there was a true self, like a deeper, truer self, an absolute self, or if there was a kind of true ego, if there was that, and somebody was telling you, you know, it would be better if you didn't get attached to that. It would be better if you didn't cling to that ego or cling to that true self. That would be one thing. And as I say, that would actually then be a form of like uh, a, a form of what? Like a kind of uh, denial, self-control in that way, where it's like there is an ego, but somebody's telling me I shouldn't get attached to it. Buddhism is not saying that. Buddhism is saying that there just isn't a self, but we think there is, and so we're clinging to it. And that's the source of suffering is the clinging, the craving in that way. So the Buddha just wants us to be blissed in that sense, not suffering. And so 
the realization or the understanding is that there just isn't a self. And we are all suffering from an over-attachment to a fiction in that way. Okay, so that's early Buddhism and its basic idea around the self, identity, and all of that. Now, what happens is, is that, and let me use this opportunity, I probably shouldn't do this, but I will. I just want to use this opportunity to explain a little bit more about that early form of Buddhism. So that early form of Buddhism, as many of you know, it's about the teaching of the five skandhas, the five aggregates. And so rather than there being a true self or like an Atman, or rather than there being an ego in that way, what there is, is actually these five aggregates. The body of physical form, the particular sensations that are being experienced right now, the particular perception that's happening right now, your past conditioning, and consciousness, the current present state of consciousness. What early Buddhism wants of the practitioner is to let go of clinging to the delusion of a self that is persistent through time. Remember in my earlier example a little while ago where I was saying, I used to be an architect, but now I'm a teacher. I used to be called Michael, but now I'm Thomas. Well, what is being presumed in those transitions from architect to teacher, from Michael to Thomas, what's being presumed in that is that there's an unchanging self who the self used to be called Michael and is now called Thomas, used to be an architect, but is now a teacher. But the self is, it's the same self. That's what the all forms of Buddhism, but the early form of Buddhism was very uh, interested in pointing out is that that's the self that's delusional. The one that's underneath all this, that's not changing, but that is experiencing the changes. Rather, Buddhism teaches, especially early Buddhism, teaches that this, and I'm pointing at you, this is an ever-changing, ever-morphing amalgamation of those five aggregates I mentioned. And what that means is, is that the only you is this right now that's hearing me, that's conscious of this now. And the idea that there was a you before, a you during, and a you after, that's the one that doesn't exist. But there is, in the early Buddhist tradition, there is the present state of the five skandhas. Oh, but wait, the five skandhas have already shifted because the aggregate of consciousness is now this consciousness, not the consciousness from a second ago, but this consciousness based upon this perception, based upon these sensations, based upon this body that you have right now, but if you lost an arm, that it would be now be that. No armed with that consciousness, which is a consciousness arising from a one-armed body that is having then sensations of only one arm rather than two. And then you, there is that. And again, the delusion is that there's a me underneath all of that change versus being the change. So that's early Buddhism and its approach to all of this. The point is, if I can bring this back to Renata's question about the womb and all of that, the point of all of this is that you can, as I said, you can, and many of us do, identify with and as the physical body. And even more importantly, 
I just mentioned how it's not just identifying with the physical body. It's identifying and clinging to the physical body now and the physical body from a year ago and 10 years ago and 20 years ago and all the way back to me as a baby. So it's already problematic from a Buddhist point of view to identify with or as the physical body. It is really problematic to identify with all the versions of that physical body. That's like really problematic because that's what's really creating the delusion of a self. Remember, the self is that idea of an unchanging experiencer that's underneath, meaning that there's this idea that I used to have a baby's body. I used to have an adolescent's body. I used to have a young adult's body, and now I have the body of an adult. That way of thinking for the Buddhist tradition is very problematic. It's problematic for a bunch of reasons. But the main reason why it's so problematic is that if I am identifying, or let me put it to you this way, if you identify with the physical body, and if you identify with the birthed body, then I've got bad news for you. <laughs> Meaning, that's why we are all so scared to death of death is because we are identifying with the body. And more importantly, we are identifying with the birthed body. And if we are identifying with the birthed baby's body and identifying with all the bodies in between, and we're identifying with the current physical body, then we cannot help but identify with an imagined future death, dying experience. So this is the idea that it's a, I often say it's a package deal, meaning that if you identify with this, then guess what? You get to celebrate birthdays and you also get to worry all the time about when you might die. But I want you to notice that that very way of thinking, I'm going to die one day, rests upon that delusional sense of an unchanging, consistent observer that is then going to go off to dying. Now, in the early Buddhist tradition, you could transcend the fear of dying. You could defeat Mara. Remember, Mara, the name Mara, means death. And a Buddha defeats Mara under the tree of enlightenment. The way that I understand that story is that a Buddha defeats the fear of dying, defeats anxiety, stress, all of the dukkha in that way. Now, in the early Buddhist tradition, the way that you could achieve that is by basically not identifying with the past and the baby body and all of that, certainly not uh, forward thinking and identifying with some imagined dying that you have not experienced yet, but you imagine all the time. So early Buddhism wanted or encouraged the practitioner to definitely not identify with an unchanging, consistent self, but rather sink into being the ever-evolving five skandhas in that way. Sort of just, you know, at any given moment, here I am in that sense. So on that note of what I just said regarding the delusions of self, identifying with physical body, and in particular, identifying with the birthed body, this is why they're talking about a Buddha 
not having anything to do with a vaginal womb-based birth. So Renata, the idea about the defilement of the womb and all of that is that it's about, or one way to think about it, is that we could be Buddha, we could be awakened. What is keeping us from that awakening is attachment to these delusions. And so there is a way in which that birthday, baby, me, the womb where I think I came into the world from, there's a way in which identifying with all of that is defiled in the sense that it's delusional and suffering producing in that way. And so a Buddha is not born. And what I'm getting at is that kind of more, I'm trying to kind of explain what they're talking about here, where it's not about the historical person, Siddhartha, wasn't born by way of a womb. We're talking about how Buddhas, awakened beings, are not vaginally born. This, this physical body, yeah, you can trace its origin. You can, yeah, absolutely, you can trace this physical body back to a birthed origin. But is that me? That's the question. Am I identifying with that? Or am I a bodhisattva in that way? And by the way, my definition of a bodhisattva is that state of non-identification. A state of just not identifying, not playing the identity game, which is usually very, you know, dualistic, very societal, again, very constructed in that way. All right, before I go any further, any questions, comments, answers, ideas about all of this? Okay. Then I just want to then say one more thing. Now, everything I've said up to this point has been sort of basic Buddhism from the early teachings. But now I want to share a little bit more of the Mahayana. So the Mahayana tradition goes a little further than what I just told you. And our sutra already alluded to this a little bit. And what it is, is, is that in the early form of Buddhism, it is said by the Mahayana that in the early form, the Buddha only taught no self, but did teach the existence of what are called dharmas, the kind of the fundamental building blocks of reality. In the Mahayana tradition, it is not only that the self is empty or non-existent, but actually even the building blocks of reality, like even the elements and all of those things, those two are empty and ultimately not real in that way. So that changes the equation a little bit. But what begins to happen in the Mahayana tradition is that they start to focus on a teaching. And there's a lot of these teachings, but one of them is a teaching that you've heard me talk about a lot if you've been coming to Dharma doors. And it's the teaching of the birthlessness of phenomena, the birthlessness of things. And you know, I've already spent a lot of time on these ideas tonight, but just a little taste of the birthlessness of phenomena. This is actually this kind of deeper Buddhist teaching, this deeper Mahayana teaching that basically recognizes that anything that you encounter, any object, or it doesn't even actually have to be a physical object, it could be an idea, a concept, whatever, but I'm going to stick with objects in that way. The Mahayana teaching is that any object that you might come across 
It's the realization that the object that I'm experiencing, like let's say it's this uh, blue mechanical pencil here, the teaching is about how this blue mechanical pencil is actually just a kind of an idea that is being entertained. And what I mean by that is, is that, and we talk about this all the time on Dharma doors, you might have a form of color blindness that I don't have. And therefore you might see this as a different color. Maybe you see it as a red mechanical pencil, whereas I see it as a blue mechanical pencil. I always use color blindness. It's a very easy starting point with this stuff. And the realization is, is if that's the case, that there's a blue mechanical pencil to me, but to somebody else, it's a red mechanical pencil. Where does the blue mechanical pencil, where is that? You can't say that it's floating out in space in front of me because it's not, because somebody else is seeing it as red. So my mechan the mechanical pencil that I'm seeing is blue, whereas the one that you would be experienced or seeing might be red. And then this goes deeper than just the color, but it goes to the use of it, what we would call it, all of these things, until eventually we can realize that this blue mechanical pencil is kind of a mirage or like a figment of the imagination in that way. And if you're with me, and I know that this that was a quick introduction to this idea, but if you're with me that the blue mechanical pencil is just a kind of concept idea that's being entertained and is not an actual existent object, the question is, who made the blue mechanical pencil? Like, where did it come from? And the point is, is that when I think that there's just a mechanical pencil out here for all of us to see, and it's just here and it's for all of us to see, then it would make sense to talk about where was this pencil made? Like, where did it come from? And we could talk about at what point it would cease to be a pencil, right? Like if I broke it, would it cease to be a pencil? Would I have to melt it for it to cease to be a pencil? So all of that, where the pencil came from and at what point it goes out of existence, the idea of the arising and ceasing of the mechanical pencil makes sense if there's a real mechanical pencil out in the world. But if we understand that the only place that the blue mechanical pencil exists as that is sort of as a mentally created image, it wasn't manufactured. That mechanical pencil didn't come from anywhere and it will never go anywhere. All right, does that make sense? So that's this kind of Mahayana extension of the original teachings of the Buddha. The Buddha originally said that you don't exist. That's just a figment of the imagination. But there are the five aggregates, the five dharmas, the five constituent elements. Those are real. But the self, nah, that's just sort of a fiction. Mahayana Buddhism realizes, or the realization of Mahayana Buddhism is, oh, it's all fictional in that way. It's all empty of inherent existence in that way. So what I just explained very quickly, very briefly, is again, this teaching of the birthlessness of phenomena. That if you understand uh, all of this phenomenologically in that sense of being kind of mental phenomena, not existent things in that way. That's understanding things as being birthless. By the way, if you understand things as birthless, you understand things as such. 
as Tathata. Now, I've focused on this teaching of birthlessness because it's kind of the same idea that I was expressing when I was talking about the early teachings. Buddhism is interested in whether it's the individual or whether it's all of phenomena. It's interested in understanding birthlessness. And by contrast, the idea of birth is defiled. It's problematic. It's ignorant. It's uh, suffering producing. So that's where we get this sort of e equation, if you will, but this idea that the, the birth is defiled, but it's not that birth is defiled. It's not that things that have come, that are born are defiled. It's the very idea of birth that's defiled. The very idea of things coming into existence, the very idea of things going out of existence, that's what's defiled, that way of thinking. And then, and now this is where we get into the extrapolation that I was talking about earlier. If we now understand that birthlessness is sort of enlightenment and pure, and thinking in terms of birth and death is defiled and impure in that way, now all of a sudden by extrapolation, things associated with birth are now problematic and defiled such as wombs in that way. One last point to make while I have all of your attention on this idea. I do want you to know that this teaching that I've just been giving you about birthlessness and about not identifying with the birth and dying body and all of that, everything I've just been talking about, in my understanding, it's where in, in Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, you will sometimes, and we've encountered this a few times, you will sometimes hear about these purified Buddha lands in which there's no women. And I often like, or I don't like to talk about this because I think it's a very problematic part of Buddhism, but I like to make clear though that when they say that, it's not this like he-man's woman-hater club. Like It's not like the pure land is this like men's only club. What's unfortunate about the language of, of Buddhism, what's unfortunate is that they don't go that extra step and talk about how there's no men in Buddha lands either. <laughs> They're not really willing to say it. They imply it. The Mahayana tradition definitely implies that Buddhas are neither male nor female. And actually you can find that, that's like canonical. That's, uh, you can find sources where the Buddhas, Buddhas are defined as neither male nor female. They imply that Buddha lands and these pure lands they imply that they are asexual. And they talk about this in, because what they say is that in Buddha lands, in pure lands, they say that the way that beings come into existence is that they pop up on lotus flowers. And so the idea is, is that, again, I, I, I said it, I'll say it again though, they should say that there's no men in pure lands either. And it's just bodhisattvas in that way. So again, you will hear this kind of language about sort of not even the name woman will be heard in a pure land. And I acknowledge, by the way, and I don't ever want to be an apologist for patriarchy or any of those things. I acknowledge that these tricky teachings about birth, birthlessness, and the womb, 
I recognize that these teachings become a doctrinal foundation upon which patriarchy survives. So I recognize that and I'm you know, here to critique that, but I also sort of find the actual teachings of like say birthlessness so profound and so interesting that I kind of don't mind going to these lengths to explain them in that way. So, okay. Questions, comments, answers, ideas about the long answer to Renata's question about the defiled womb. Okay, let's read a little Dharma. Oh, sorry, Noe, did you have a question? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, great, thank you, thank you. Yeah, I, I, I just absolutely uh, love this, the direction of, of, of unborn, is the mm. idea of born. Uh, and where is that right here? If I'm unborn, I'm right here. And there's, and so when I, when I think about dreams, before I dream, because when I'm dreaming, I'm dreaming. But before I dream, I'm unborn. There's nothing. It's kind of cool. <laughs> and I woke up. And I, I started dreaming and I woke up. But if I, as I go through the day with the idea of being unborn, that puts me in this very moment. This moment. This moment, as you were referring to earlier. And the other thing is, absolutely, the Chinese translated this, you know, how many hundreds of years, and they had to hang on to the norm of what, like, when they translated to the emperor, they had to throw in Chinese ideas in order to make it attractive to the patriarchy of society, unfortunately. But I also, I, I agree, I, there, is, there is neither man nor woman in enlightenment. Nice. Or, or in all of this, because <clears throat> we're not born. Very Thank you. Thank you, Noe. Thanks for that. Okay, so now that we have that in mind, I'm going to read a little bit more from the the sutra. So I also wanted to share this really quickly. Um. The other reason why I'm really interested in this section, actually this whole sutra, but this section, I haven't done it for a while, but some of you, especially from the old days, like way back in the day, you might remember that one of the things that I really enjoy doing is telling a kind of out, about an hour long, um, a telling of the story of Siddhartha. I've been doing it like, long time, like basically even when I taught in colleges, I would always start my course on Buddhism. The first class, I would basically tell the story of Siddhartha. And, you know, I really love storytelling, as many of you know, I think it's a really effective way of delivering information. And so I myself, in telling the story of the Buddha so many times uh, for a lot of different audiences, I myself became very, how can I put this? Two points. I became very familiar with like the bullet points, if you will, of the story of the Buddha. Like you always got to mention that the Buddha flew in as an elephant into his mother's right side. And you always have to mention that the Buddha pops out of his mother's uh, right side when he's born. And you always have to mention like, so there's these bullet points that it's like, it's not the story of Siddhartha if you haven't mentioned these things. So I'm very interested in this sutra and this section because it's going through the bullet points, but it's kind of giving this really interesting like twist on each of the bullet points. So as a storyteller, I find that very interesting. And I also, this is my second point about the story of Siddhartha. In my telling of the story of Siddhartha, it is entirely upaya. It is entirely a skillful means. And what, what I mean by that is that when I tell the story, I, for example, I have told the story of Siddhartha 
to a group of eight, nine, 10 year olds, very young. In fact, I've actually done the story of Siddhartha more for children than I've done it for adults. But I've also taught or told the story of Siddhartha for uh, Dharma centers, you know, so people who know their Dharma very well. I've taught, I've told the story of Siddhartha at like a retirement home to just a bunch of random old people. Don't ask me how I got in that situation. But my point is, is that if I'm telling the story of Siddhartha to a group of eight year olds, you better believe it's a different version of the story than I tell to a bunch of adults that, that know Dharma. And that's different than the story I tell to a bunch of adults who don't know Dharma. So I adapt the story as an upaya to fit the audience, to be the most effective in communicating the Dharma, because that's what upaya is all about, knowing your audience and knowing how to effectively communicate the Dharma. So me having a kind of a personal relationship with the story of Siddhartha as Upaya, I'm, I was very uh, delighted and surprised to see the story of Siddhartha being presented here as an Upaya, but like a new Upaya, where they are, again, revamping the whole story and taking it out of the realm of history and putting it into the realm of I don't even know what kind of mythology, something like that. So a few more of the bullet points of the life story of Siddhartha, but told the Mahayana way. So if you'll remember, these are a series of questions. And it's, it's funny because when I would teach this story to the children, they would often often ask these kinds of questions like, well, but why? Why did the Buddha pop out of his mother's side? Like those kinds of things. So our, um, our curious, whoever it is, asks, why was the Bodhisattva born in a secluded place, not at home or in a city? If, if you know, you might know, uh, the mother of the Buddha, Maya, actually took a journey from Magadha, where the Buddha uh, was conceived, I guess, and actually began journeying to Nepal, where Maya was from. But midway going to Nepal, she went into labor in the Lumbini Garden, a secluded garden. But why? was the Buddha born in a secluded place and not at home or the city? The Bodhisattva always delighted in solitude. He praised being lonely, solitary. He praised spots in a mountain forest as good places to cultivate ultimate quiescence. If the Bodhisattva had been born at home or in the city, no god, naga, ghost, spirit, or gandharava would have come to offer him fragrant flowers, powdered incense, perfumed ointments, and countless hundreds of thousands of kinds of music when he was born. All the people of Kapila at that time, Kapila was the city where the Buddha was from, all the people at that time were intemperate, unrestrained, and arrogant. They couldn't make offerings to the Bodhisattva. Therefore, he was born in a secluded place, not at home or in the city. And this was all in Upaya, practiced by the Bodhisattva. Another bullet point of the life story of the Buddha. Why did the Bodhisattva's mother reach up and hold a branch of a tree when she gave birth to the Bodhisattva. Sentient beings might suspect that Queen Maya went through travail when she gave birth to the Bodhisattva, just as other women do when they give birth. In order to show that she was joyful, she reached up and held the branch when she gave birth to the Bodhisattva. 
This was an upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. And now the next one is the one that I was wanting to make sure we got to. And why did the Bodhisattva come into the world with right mindfulness, appearing through the right side of his mother, not through any other part of her body? So, as I mentioned, this is a classic part of the story of the Buddha, that Maya had a dream in which a white elephant entered into her right side, and then miraculously, 10 months later, the Bodhisattva came out of her right side. Now, I have heard many people kind of interpret this as, oh, it was a cesarean section. I'm not here to say it wasn't a cesarean section, but according to this sutra, in terms of the question, why did the Buddha come or was born out of the right side of the mother and not through any other part? The pure deeds of the Bodhisattva were supreme, the most venerable in the great billion-fold world universe. He did not enter through the female organ or come out of it. Only a Bodhisattva who will become a Buddha in their next life can perform such a feat. Not any other cultivator of pure conduct can do it. Hence, the Bodhisattva came into the world through his mother's right side. Though he, though he was born thus, he really came from nowhere. Just as he entered no place in his pure conception described before. This was an upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. So that one kind of summarizes my whole opening remarks, that in reality, a Buddha or a Bodhisattva in that way doesn't come from anywhere, right? Okay. Everybody doing okay so far? These just kicking back. Nice. And why was it that the god Chakra Devanam Indra, not any other god, why was it Chakra who received the Bodhisattva with a precious garment when he was born? Well, that's because Chakra had made this vow in the past. When the Bodhisattva is born, I will receive him with a precious garment because of his wonderful good roots. This will cause other gods to have more faith in the Bodhisattva, more respect for him, and to make more offerings to him. This was all just an upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. And now, this one, this one is actually what I had originally planned as like it was the, the stated topic or the stated theme for tonight's Dharma doors. The, the theme that I gave uh, that I gave the SFDC for tonight, it was the question, why did the Buddha take seven steps? So this is a part of the story of Siddhartha that after he was born, after he pops out of his mother's right side. He takes seven steps, and each place that he steps, a lotus flower pops out of the ground and supports his little feet so that he doesn't touch the ground. He doesn't touch the world in that way, but takes these seven steps. And this is one of my, one of my favorite answers to these questions. So why did the Bodhisattva take seven steps, not six, and not eight, <laughs> immediately after he was born. The Bodhisattva, doubtless, had great miraculous powers, great vigor, and the auspicious signs of a great man. And he wished to show sentient beings a manifestation that no one else could make. If it had been more beneficial to sentient beings for him to walk six steps, then to walk seven steps, then the Bodhisattva would have walked six steps. 
if it had been more if it had been more beneficial to sentient beings to walk eight steps instead of seven steps, then the Bodhisattva would have walked eight steps. Since it was most beneficial to sentient beings for him to walk seven steps, he walked seven steps, not six, not eight, with no one supporting him. This was the upaya practiced by the bodhisattva mahasattva. So, great answer, right? Right? If it had been better for it to be six, he would have taken six. That's why he took seven. <laughs> but notice right at the end there, that last little reference, without being, or with no one supporting him. That is sort of this kind of, again, a reference to a lot of the ideas I was actually talking about. The language is a little different in terms of supporting him, but I would go back to everything I was talking about, about the self being supported by identity, and a Buddha is not supported by anything. No identification in that sense. All right. Let's do, yeah, there's a couple of more. We'll see if we can do at least one or two. A couple more about the seven steps. So I'd love to kind of wrap this seven step section. I'd like to wrap it that up tonight. So why did the Bodhisattva say after he had taken the seven steps, why did he say, I am supreme, the most venerable in the world? I am free from old age, sickness, and death. Well, at that time in the assembly, which beheld the birth of the Bodhisattva, Chakra, Brahma, and other gods were very proud and had claimed, the gods, they had claimed, I am the most venerable in the world. Since the gods were arrogant and conceited, they had no respect for anyone else. At that time, the Bodhisattva thought, the gods are arrogant. Because of this, they will fall back into the three miserable planes of existence in the long night of samsara. Consequently, he said, I'm supreme, the most venerable in the world. I am free from old age, illness, and death. When he said that, his voice was heard throughout the entire billion-fold world system. Those gods who had not come to see him at that time, at the time of his birth, all came when they heard his voice proclaim, I am supreme. Then the gods of the realm of desire and the realm of form joined their palms respectfully and paid homage to the Bodhisattva. They said to one another, how marvelous. This is why the Bodhisattva spoke truthfully after he had walked seven steps saying, I am supreme, the most venerable in the world. I am free from old age, sickness, and death. This was an upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. And in case you didn't catch it, of course, that reference to being, having transcended, what's the language? Being free from old age, illness, and death. I gave you all the keys to how to do that. I, gave, I told you that was the idea. Depending upon what you're identifying with, old age, illness, and death can get you in that sense. And they all get us all in that way insofar as we identify with that which gets sick, in that sense. All right, and let's just do this last one. It's one more about the seven steps. And why did the Bodhisattva laugh loudly after he had walked the seven steps? He laughed not because of desire, not because of arrogance, not because of frivolity, at that time, the Bodhisattva thought, now these sentient beings who have come to see me, they have desire, they have hatred, they have ignorance and other afflictions. 
as they have had in their past lives. I previously persuaded them all to bring forth bodhicitta. Now I have already reached accomplishment, but they are still in samsara, still in the ocean of suffering, with their afflictions still unsevered, because they have been idle and negligent. These sentient beings and I brought forth bodhicitta all at the same time. Now I've already attained enlightenment, but they're still in samsara, in the ocean of suffering, because they've been idle and negligent. These sentient beings, out of desire for material gains, neglected to make vigorous efforts to pursue all-knowing wisdom. Now they are still in a position of paying homage and making offerings to me. In the past, I took great compassion upon them and vowed to attain enlightenment to deliver them all. Now I have fulfilled my vow. It was for this reason that the Bodhisattva laughed loudly. This was the Upaya practiced by the Bodhisattva Mahasattva. All right, so I'm going to conclude the reading there. Any questions, comments, answers, ideas about anything that came up tonight? Just going to take a peek. I know that Renata had written another comment earlier. Yeah, uh, Renata has a great comment about how collective delusions can get rolling with extremely harmful effects and be difficult to manage. Yep. Excellent. Cool. Um, then on that note, I'm going to call it a night.